Welcome to this episode of the Erasing Shame podcast. I'm your host, DJ Chuang. I'm joined with Pastor Dave Lee and Irene Cho. They're both in the Chicagoland area, and you'll get to know them as we talk about how they've come together to form a little gathering on a quarterly basis called Pastors and Counselors Together, which has a neat little acronym called PACT. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Irene, for joining me. You're welcome. Thanks for having us. So we'll jump right in and let's learn about uh, how you came together to form this little gathering called PACT and what what do you try to do? Well, PACT started uh, around 2017, I think, if if I try to trace back the history a little bit. It's a little little fuzzy, so the dates might not be perfect. Um, But it was kind of born out of this place where I was doing a lot of counseling with um, Asian Americans. And that was a a newer thing. um, Because as I when I started in doing counseling, I didn't have very many Asian clients, but all of a sudden, I was seeing quite a few in my office. Mm -hmm. Um, And at the same time, they, you know, a lot of my Asian clients were really heavily involved in their churches, um, but didn't really feel like their issues that they were struggling with emotionally were um, were welcome in the church or some of the teachings or things that they would hear about mental health in the church were um, difficult for them based on what they were struggling with in their personal lives. Um, and they were feeling a lot like they had to put like a false mask on, you know, like when they would go to church and then, you know, feeling quite alone, I guess, is the best way to put it. Um, And so at that time, I thought, wow, it's such a shame because I see these people once a week, you know, for an hour, maybe two times a week, if I'm lucky, to be support for these really tough things. Um, And yet the church is like doing life with them and could potentially be such a a resource for the people that I'm working with. And at the same time, I kind of knew that pastors are sort of overwhelmed with a lot of the mental health issues within their congregations, and they can't be doing that for everybody. So I just thought, well, would there be a way for us to work together more and to be kind of learning from each other with some kind of um, some kind of group? So that's when I reached out to Pastor Dave and just asked him, like, I want to just get a, a feel for if he'd if he and others, if he thought that people might be interested in something like this and if there was a need. Um, and so that's when I reached out to Pastor Dave. Uh, I'll let you talk, Pastor Dave, about that. Yeah. Yeah, that was, I, it was actually at a coffee shop that doesn't even exist anymore. But yeah. I, I still remember <laughs> that that conversation really well because it was such a, a God thing, timing wise. Um, while Irene was feeling a lot of those things from the counselor end, I was experiencing a lot of those things from the pastoral end. Uh, I, I and many of my colleagues were becoming more aware what the boundaries of pastoral counseling were and when we were stepping out of our depth into realms that were beyond us, but also not helpful, sometimes even more harmful to the mm-hmm. people in our churches. When we try to do professional therapy as pastors and we were not trained for it, and and so there was this um, feeling of tension because I I think we were one of the early churches that in the Asian American context here in our city that was becoming more open to help seeking and mental health and therapy and counseling. But as we started sending people out, we didn't really know very many Asian American therapists. Yeah. And there were times when we'd send people to a mainstream culture therapist and very godly, loving people, very gifted at what they do. But sometimes they miss the nuances of this particular cultural and ethnic context. Mm -hmm. And so well-meaning advice was sometimes backfiring into really very difficult results. And and so I was really looking for connections with more Asian American Christian counselors. And Irene was well-connected in that regard. And so there was this meeting of, I always think about that um, Reese's peanut butter cup commercial from when I was younger, where two people bump into each other and, hey, your chocolate got into my peanut butter. <laughs> you know, and uh, that was actually the feeling is, wow, this is exactly what we needed yeah. was an intersection of these two. 
And so in that conversation, the two of us together represented in microcosm what I think was a big thing brewing in the city, which was pastors and counselors needed a connecting place. Mm -hmm. And so when we found like a common um, bridge to cross between the two of us, we realized what could come out of this is something a little more structured and formal. Uh, And I was part of a, a group of pastors who were meeting regularly, trying to support one another. And Irene, you were part of the, the catch network that was beginning to form. Right. And that's the, uh, you, if you want to just talk about that. Of, yeah, it's a community of Asian American therapists in Chicagoland that um, myself and another colleague of mine, Jane Lee, began here around the same time as PACT. And so we had a um, a group already forming of Asian uh, therapists identifying as Asian that were working in the mental health field and also had like a strong interest in helping Asian Americans in Chicagoland. And so, you know, since we had that group already forming, we thought, Hey, what if we get our groups together and just start having a dialogue um, about some of this stuff. And that's when we started meeting. I think it was shortly after our first meeting, Pastor Dave, where we got um, a bunch of us together and we just started, I think the first biggest, Thing for us was building um, trust and friendship between the two groups because you know when you're working in silos, you know, independent of each other, there can be some mistrust that happens um, because people have bad experiences on both ends, and so we just really wanted to develop a um, like a safe place for us to start getting to know one another and to really learn about what the struggles were on both sides and build that relationship. So that's what we started doing in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Well, that's remarkable because I've been talking with pastors and counselors across the country and have not found something like what you're doing there in Chicago. And -hmm. you would think with Asian American populations very much more densely uh, located in cities like New York and LA or San Francisco or even Seattle, you know, they don't quite have this kind of a gathering happening yet. And so mm-hmm. it's so inspiring to hear what you're doing. And it's not a heavy lift. You're mm-hmm. just getting together maybe once a quarter yeah. and you're having a meal together. So uh, in our previous mm-hmm. conversation, Irene, you said having the meal actually is a critical piece of that <laughs> bonding yes. of, uh, relationship. Yeah. along with meaningful content and discussion. So mm-hmm. tell us about how that's developed over the years since you started meeting in about 2018. And of course, you had COVID in the mix of that. So just walk yeah. us through how you've grown to make these effective for the pastors and counselors you're gathering. Yeah, I think Irene was right. There was a lot of mistrust initially between the two groups because I think there were stereotypes that we carried uh, because sometimes we would look across the aisle at counselors and think they're either going to try to medicate our people or just coddle them and tell them everything they're going through is someone else's fault, you yeah. know, and that they don't name things like sin as part of the contributing factors. And so there was mistrust of like, we can't just hand them over. Yeah. But then that's partly because we had never been in therapy sessions ourselves or didn't have a personal relationship with them. Mm-hmm. And on the other end, you know, a lot of people who seek counseling have church hurt, and there are some legitimately bad actors out there who are doing ministry. Mm-hmm. And so they were becoming a little more cynical and mistrustful of what pastors might say. And rightfully, a lot of pastors way overstep their expertise and try to do more than they should be. Mm-hmm. And so I think we, we first needed to clear there and just form relationships. So we were meeting to have open-ended conversations about different things. And then we realized we would benefit greatly if the the content matter experts could share some of these things in a more formal didactic setting. And so we invited the counselors to um, help educate the pastors on how to locate the boundaries between pastoral counseling and professional counseling, and also to help us understand the methodologies and other things. Also to prepare pastors for, you know, triaging and initially encountering people with things like depression and anxiety and things like that. And and over time, it also shifted to where we also began to see why the counselors would benefit from hearing pastors. And and the one metaphor that I think Irene and I have thrown around quite a bit that seems to make sense is it's sort of like we are we as pastors are general practitioners and the therapists are like oncologists. And we're trying to um, treat the same patient, but from very different sides. 
and there's a specialization, but there's also just the overall general health and the milieu in which that person lives that also promotes well-being and healing. But there's also that very specialized, targeted therapy that is so needed, which the generalist cannot provide. And so this is a collaboration. And so we, we, have, we have done a lot of teaching, like seminar type things. And in recent years, we've moved more towards a, um, a case study format. And I think maybe Irene could talk a little bit about the way that that's worked out. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Like, uh, it's really been helpful to just hear from the pastor side, like the types of stuff um, that their people are struggling with. Because just working in, you know, my little private practice setting, I see all kinds of things. But I have no idea what people are sharing in the church and how those issues are being treated or what does the church do? You know, for example, when someone's noticeably depressed or when a couple is really struggling or when somebody's just lost a baby or something, you know, like, I don't know. I mean, I kind of hear about a meal train and like, you know, people do these types of, like the church, man, if you need people to be feet on the ground, bringing meals and loving someone like that. I think they're like, I just haven't found other communities that even touch or parallel what the Christian church can do. But like, I just didn't know what does it look like when someone's struggling with a mental illness? How do people deal with it? And there's so much stigma within the Asian culture, stereotypically in general, that, you know, are people coming forward and talking about this? What do pastors see? Like, how do you, like, I do see pastors as like the first line of defense, right? So I just wanted to know how it was presented. So we started having pastors write these um, case things where they would talk and describe a situation that maybe they experienced in their church, not with you know specifics, but in a generalized sense, like what would we do? And then um, basically we would, both sides would look at the case and we would sort of talk about like what our thoughts would be in terms of how to help this person. And we just really kind of wrestled with the integration and the intersection of spirituality and um, mental health. And we would just talk about all the dynamics that we're thinking about when an individual comes in. And essentially those discussions have been the richest for me because um, the didactic teaching is important, but then just really hearing about um, the practical side of it and wrestling with sometimes not knowing what the best thing is too, you know, but just like sitting together with, those issues in a way where everybody feels like they're safe, you know, to, to share what's really going on for them and to be able to come to their own conclusions about what, you know, how they might want to shift the way they're doing it. I mean, myself included, you know, when I'm working with somebody from a spiritual perspective, you know, trying to consider some of what um, hurdles or obstacles or things that were, it might be difficult you know, for them from a Christian perspective. So, so yeah, so that's kind of how we've evolved. Um, Cause it, in the beginning, it was more of like the counselors would come and present a topic, but I, we found that over time, the actual discussions were much more fruitful and rich. Um, and so we've shifted more to that model and that's really been good for us. And, and food was always there from the beginning. Pastor Dave's church has been, <laughs> so generous and amazing at the other churches too and just um providing that for us and and sometimes just afterwards after the actual meeting just getting to know each other's lives and the things that are happening with each person has been really um, valuable as well so yeah. yeah well let's um as people listen to this they they might be inspired they see this as valuable what would be some tips that you would share with uh, a small group of, I mean, you just need two or three pastors, maybe two or three counselors in, let's say, Los Angeles. And they said, this sounds like a great idea. It can be very valuable. But let's try it out. What tips mm -hmm. would you give them on how they can get started and uh, something that would be valuable over time? Mm, that's a great question. Yeah, because you're you're four years into it, yeah. So you're way way ahead of the curve uh, compared to others. I, I mean, I would say that 
we didn't have a grand design from the start, but maybe I can describe the way it unfolded for us because it it seemed like a really great progression. Mm-hmm. It started with the two of us just being champions on either side and being committed to this nexus. That's really important that, you know, like when four people kind of decide to go out to eat, it'll be an hour later you're in the car. I think the two of us just really feel like this needs to happen. Uh, we We started approaching other people in our fields and rallying them to it. And the next phase was finding people who aren't just passingly interested, but really resonated with what we're describing. And we had a small handful of pastors and counselors who decided to be part of a leadership team. Uh, it, it, we didn't formally call it a board, but effectively it, it functioned that way. They helped plan things. And and so it was, you know, a half dozen of us, not just the two of us, mm-hmm. owning the responsibility for navigating where to go and guarding this. It really helped to have someone volunteer to be an administrator to do a lot of the busy work required because we found the professionals on both sides really just didn't have the bandwidth to keep all the plates spinning. So that was a huge help. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, that it started that way with a team that really gave momentum to it. And like uh, like Irene was saying in the beginning, just a lot of starting by really listening to the other side and trying to understand where they are coming from. And then beginning to, as we build trust, to speak openly and honestly about how we regarded one another and how we were feeling in some of the tensions. And we're at a point now where we trust each other so much, like we can openly uh, disagree or yeah. push back. And it's been so fruitful to be able to do that. Mm-hmm. No, go ahead. Go ahead, Irene. I was just even just um, normalizing some of that, like from the beginning, you know, that that's a phase, I guess, of um, developing this type of relationship, I think, because, you know, it's obvious to me that when we, every time we get together, that both sides care so much about people, the people that they're serving, you know, the people that we're working with. And, um, you know, we're, we're bringing that in and sometimes it can create, you know, like we, I could have my dukes up a little bit, like, you know, try to protect my people. Um, And it takes a little bit of time for that to just calm down a bit. And for you, for everybody to just feel like we can be ourselves and challenge each other and even just name the mistrust that comes up is just a normal thing, you know? Um, And I guess like for me, it's like really been helpful to be in person. So like, I know probably it's, it's more, practical or you know efficient when you meet online but like the actual meeting with people has been a game changer for me in terms of building that trust and that comfort um but it takes time you know so I guess just really finding people that have a passion for it that are willing to put in the time has made you know a ton of a difference for our community so far Fantastic. Yeah, we found that the quarterly gathering is a really good cadence. It gives us enough time to prepare adequately for things and to get the word out. And then the leadership team will meet somewhere midpoint between the quarterlies to plan things and to. uh, Mm -hmm. And then Irene and I connect every month just to keep, like, from the leadership perspective, make sure that the the ship is headed in the right direction. So that that's it's not a very um, labor intensive effort. It, it really isn't. Yeah. And because it's helpful, it's actually virtuous. So the work um, actually produces fruit mm-hmm. and brings you joy and health. So that's a very valuable thing. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Now you don't have a website or anything. So for those that are in the <laughs> Chicago area that don't know yet know about you uh i can add a link in the show notes so they can contact you through your website dave your church website yeah. harvest community church mm-hmm. and you're out in uh, hoffman estates is that right yep yep okay. and then you can Irene... include my email too if you want yeah people okay can certainly if they have any questions or want any help in setting up their okay. their little groups we'd be happy to do that now, I know for those of us that are English speaking, it's easy to manage communicating. Uh, have you begun to venture into Asian languages as you're serving this Asian American diversity? That's a great thought. And the answer is no, we haven't. No. <laughs> we're, we're still just beginning to tackle Asian American 
<laughs> people. Uh, I, I can mention though that one fun thing that's developed in the last couple of years is we've seen more people from the from the academy oh, on the training side mm. of counseling come into the fold. And so we've actually changed our acronym. It's still P- packed, but the A now stands for academics. And so we're pastors, academics, and counselors together. <laughs> And we realize that's important because the long game is like the, the biggest issue we have now that we're open to help seeking is that the limited number of therapists just don't have space for more clients. Mm-hmm. And so we keep running to that brick wall of referring and only to find out from our, our people that uh, none of those therapists were able to take anyone on at the time. So we're, we're also having conversations about the long game of encouraging and promoting this as a career path for young people. Mm-hmm. And and to and to try to do something about the supply side of counselors because we are going to need so many more to handle what's coming in the days ahead, and we just don't have enough. Mm-hmm. And so having the academy in with us has been really cool. Yeah, and and also just even thinking about research things that we could do as we yes. kind of go along. I mean, this stuff is so important as we're kind of creating it as we go along, just to have some data behind it. So yes. you know having that arm of it has been really, really fruitful. So if, if as you're, as the people are thinking about forming their groups, including students and teachers mm. and other people with a like mind would be really, really cool. So. That's right. Wow. Our church has already benefited from a couple partnerships with um, labs at research labs at Wheaton, and we're providing them good data, and they are providing us with incredible resources. And it's been a really great win-win collaboration in that intersection of the academy and the church, which was not a thing I had foreseen. Yeah, uh, It's not anything we originally conceived of with PAC, but it's been one of the great blessings to see that third entity mm-hmm. come in and be such a blessing to us. Mm-hmm. Wow, that's phenomenal to hear. Thanks for the latest, latest update. Because yeah. yeah. as a person with lived experience, and as I'm part of uh, gathering an alliance of pastors, counselors, researchers, and academics, as well as nonprofits to really address this mental health issue on a meta and a national level. Uh, I'm discovering, I just received a new book that's coming out next month by Judy Cha, who's mm-hmm. the director of Redeemer Counseling Services in New York City. Yeah. Um, it's about our identity in Christ and how that affects our psychological well being. And so this whole field, on the academic side of integrating spirituality with psychology is still very frontier and pioneering. Yeah. And so you're, you're at the front end of that as well, Mm. uh, as well as building the partnership between uh, church pastors and counselors. So I'm cheering you on, look for staying connected. Thank you for sharing your story and we continue to move by faith. And I want to thank all the people who are watching and listening here on erasingshame.com. By the links in the show notes that you connect with Dave and Irene. Thank you again for your time, uh, both thank listeners you. and speakers as well. Blessings it's to our you. Pleasure. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Erasing Shame podcast. Check out the show notes at erasingshame.com and subscribe to our email for updates. We would love to hear from you, so please add your comments at our website or on social. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or any podcast app, and you can also subscribe on YouTube or follow on Facebook. Please add a rating and review so we can reach more people with our message of health, hope, and compassion. This podcast is the digital outreach of Christian Asian Mental Health.